So welcome to this second Insiders, uh, Insiders track for the ABSA Business Day Supplier Development Awards. My name is Catherine Weinberg and I'm the CEO of Fatola. I'm passionate about radically scaling the success of small businesses as a way to stimulate inclusive economy and create these much needed jobs. I do this by leading a professional team of growth specialists who build businesses that last. These are resilient, reliable and effective suppliers that really underpin the base of the economy. I'm particularly passionate about participation, part partnership and collaboration. And it's in that role that I'm here as a founding partner of the ABSA Business Day uh, Supplier Development Awards. These awards recognize excellence, encourage best practice, and really foster this climate of collaboration and sharing. And it's in that vein of sharing and sharing lessons and really encouraging uh, active uh, participation and active questioning from the industry that these insider tracks have been designed. I'm delighted today to be able to present you two very exciting case studies, and I'll speak a little bit more about that just now, but two very different case studies that really illustrate the full the gamut of the possibilities in supplier development. But before I go to that detail, I'd like again just to thank our sponsor, ABSA, who really have been uh, anchors of uh, allowing these supplier development awards to grow over the years, and they themselves are passionate about building the suppliers in their own supply chain and through, through active financing of small suppliers, enabling the growth of other people's supply chains as well. So thank you to ABSA, you're amazing partners, and uh, we love working with you. So now if I'd like to go to the first case study, in fact, maybe before I do that, I'm going to just pose exactly what we're, what we're running with here. These two different case studies, both of which are part, they were winners in the 2021 ABSA Business Day Supplier Development Awards in the small supplier category. The first case study is going to be from Distel and uh, Stella Agri, and that's a, a conversation that is really about speaking about business, a business uh, transformation that comes from the inside upwards. And that's a very interesting case study in agriculture, because in agri we know agriculture is one of the least transformed sectors in, in South Africa. So very excited to be able to present that case study. The second case study is also in quite a tricky sector, in the mining sector, and you will hear in this case study exactly why that's tricky. But this is a very different case study. This is really a case study of super growth, of mega growth, and taking a business uh, from uh, kind of fostering a business, a startup, uh, starting a business that's really on a mega scale for growth. So they're two very different case studies that have meaning for different parts of the supply chain. And uh, I think it's going to be a really excellent and very exciting session that we're setting out ourselves up for. So first of all, let me introduce uh, the story from Distel and Stella Agri. And so here we have uh, to present, we have Charles Wyeth. He is the ESD manager for Distel. And he's going to speak on, um, he's going to give us the scenario, the reasons why uh, Distel started this program, uh, why they're interested, and this was a particular opportunity for them that they really leapt at. And then he's going to introduce you to Lucas Tienison, otherwise sometimes known as Lassie, who is uh, the, the, the small, uh, was a small, uh, a more small business that started really from the inside uh, and, and part of the, his supplier called uh, Stella Agri, Stella Agri Organics. And so this is, I think I'm just going to hand over to you, Charles. You've got all the stories and uh, let's, let's, let's hear it. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks to the delegates that are present today. I think um, before we start, I must say a big thank you to Fatola, to ABSA and to the Business Day for making this competition possible. I think supplier development is such an important part of um, our economic ecosystem and especially the whole process of small business development. So certainly from my side, um, I would like to just present, um, share my screen with you and then to speak about the challenges that we face within the agricultural sector and you touched on it a few seconds ago when you made reference to the agricultural sector particularly commercial agriculture being one of the most or one of the least transformed sectors in the economy 
This is a huge problem. But before I jump in there, let me just give you some background information about the stone. Um, we are a producer and marketer of fine wine, spirits and ready to drink beverages. We at this stage, we are the largest um, such company in on the African continent. Um, we are JSC listed and we're owned main, primarily by Remgro. And in 2020, our revenues exceeded just over 23 billion rand. And even though Distel was created in 2000 by the merger of Stellenbosch Farmers Winery and the Distillers Corporation, we've actually been operating since just um, since about 1925. So as a South African company, we really are committed to supporting government's economic development principles of growth, equity and employment. These are three um, items that are fundamental to our business and to our developmental um, approach that we apply across um, the value chain and through all our operations. But one of the biggest challenges we encounter is that within the wine grape farming sector in particular, the margins are extremely small and limited. Um, and what you often find in such tight um, or tough growing or operating environment, you find that sustainable farming practices are not always employed by farmers when they start facing short term challenges. And then over the last two years, the alcohol bans that um, came as a result of COVID also inflicted additional challenges on the um, farming sector. All of this creating an environment that makes transformation very difficult to implement, particularly because of those high barriers to entry in terms of the initial investment and then the waiting time before you get any return, particularly when it comes to apples, which we use in our ciders, and then of course the grapes for the wine. So what Distel started thinking about is how do we introduce some type of intervention that can leverage resources of ours as well as our big suppliers and the other farmers and um, really use that to find alternative income streams. And that's where we thought of a cash supporting cash cropping um, businesses as a viable and sustainable alternative for um, to the commercial um, farming operations um, that are going on on the farms in any case. And we then started working closely with Stella Agri, which is um, a phenomenal company uh, led by Willem Rousseau and his vision of transforming one of the biggest um, commercial, um, or the biggest organic farmer of wine in the West Coast region. And he'd already implemented successful land ownership um, transformation project himself on his own farm and the adjacent farm. Um, and they also had a challenge to <laughs> replace the existing uh, contractor or farm manager that had been uh, employed and they wanted uh, somebody that was much more in touch with what was going on on the farm itself. Um, and the amazing thing was there that um, in addition to wanting to see further transformation in all stages of their value chain, they also wanted to support a local uh, person who had come through the ranks within the company. And what we found then that is as the Stella Agri, as this new initiative was called, um, a new farming initiative that was started, majority black owned, um, Stella Winery was then saying, let's get this company up and running now and let's support it as fully as we could. And what had happened was from starting at a very small scale, this company grew um, from about 15 hectares to over 100 hectares within a period of two years. And I was intrigued by Patricia's comment earlier on when she made reference to the ecosystem for development. This is really what enables things in our in the small business environment. So just jumping back to Stella Agri again and from Destel's perspective, we wanted to see greater equity and participation of black farmers in the rural economy because it's the right thing if we wish to transform our society and our, and our sectors. 
And then we'd identified um, an individual and um, Stella Willem in particular came forward and said, you know, we, we all want to do this initiative. Um, we need to find the right kind of guy with the right mindset, with the right attitude, with the right vision. And um, Kenneth and Lucas was this individual that had been identified, um, who was basically a, uh, a farm laborer within their cellar environment and had shown all the right kind of attitude and the right kind of willingness to make a difference. And um, in the end, we would want to say, we want Stella Agri as this majority black and company to be a true beacon of inspiration and motivation for other farmers in the Fredendal Ebenezer area, because of course there'd been a fantastic government initiative around land, land restitution. And this was particularly something we wished to Thanks, Charles. I think thank you for that. Uh, we haven't managed to get hold of Lucas, um, but what I am going to suggest is that I'm going to ask Elmarie, who has worked closely with him over the last um, while, to just give a summary, Elmarie, as a senior mentor yourself, a senior small business growth specialist with a background in agriculture. What particularly has stood out for you about Lassie's story? And sorry that we have to speak in his absence, but let's try and get a let's try and get a um, a, a sense of who he is and what was this opportunity. What did it mean to him? Thank you so much, Kathy. Yes, I was really looking forward to having Lassie on this call, especially because I would have the opportunity to speak Afrikaans, <laughs> you know. But um, I think what really stood out for me from the conversations that I've had with Lassie over the last few weeks is that he had tremendous ambition. You know, he was a laborer, but that's not where he wanted to stay. And he grabbed every opportunity to learn management skills and when and that's the kind of thing that made him stood out and when the opportunity came came in he stepped in and he said i'll do this and um the other thing that that was really you know kind of really stood out for me was in an in an environment where you are a laborer and then you move up the ranks and you become a manager it can be emotionally it's a it's a it's a tremendous mindset change that you have to go through and it's also, you know, it can be it can be difficult emotionally uh, because boundaries that change. And when I asked Asi about this, I mean, he just was thinking that he was going to and tell me how difficult this was, and he just said he just got on of a of a small business owner mindset, you know, of somebody that understands that sometimes relationships have to change so that you can grow your business and those are the things that really stood out for me the other thing of course that I was really impressed with is his ability to um, you know to build a relationship with the buyers from Woolworths I mean we know that Woolworths is you know their whole brand is around quality and um, you know the, the the reliability of their quality and especially because this is organic and, and Lassie loves that relationship. You know, he doesn't see it as something that is intimidating. For him, it is an opportunity to show what he's really passionate about. And Thank I think you. that is the reason why Woolworths continue to work with him. Thank you. Thanks, Elmarie. I see that we have actually got Lassie. Uh, Lassie um, has joined the delegate, uh, the participant panel. Are you there, Lassie? Um, you've got a last, the last few minutes uh, maybe just to just to greet and and particularly I'll give you a little bit of time. Maybe uh, I'd like to ask you maybe one question. Uh, what what was the most uh, what was the most scary moment in being selected for this super growth uh, uh, for this group super growth path that you're on? Yeah, that was too much. That was for me. It was a few months of work in place. Really, in the clean beginning. Op de 23 hectare um, plaats werk en ons is dan ook aan zijn bonnen ten 5 hectare. Um, ja, om elke dag net op te staan en aan te pakken wat je krijgt, producten leveren waarvan je ook leent gelukkig, wat je ook leent gelukkig zal houden. Excellent, thank you so much. I mean, I think that we often, when we sit in corporate, we often only consider the concerns that we have, that we only think about our fears and risks, and often don't understand that there are fears and risks from the entrepreneur as well. I think what's important for, for, for uh, that I've understood from this case study is that Lassie, you are an unusual person because you really are motivated to succeed. And I'd be interested 
to know um, what your you know what your vision is going into the future. Where do you see where do you see this whole journey of growth taking you? Uh, yeah, the om net een beetje groter te gaan. Ons nou rond 50 hectare om net groter, meer klanten te werven voor ons, is so zodat ons een beter mark is en dan om ons eie verpakking te doen vir hoe loot. Excellent. I mean, I think that I know um, I know many small suppliers whose dream is working for Woolworths and companies like Woolworths. Um, and when they get there, they kind of wish that they hadn't because it is such a difficult, uh, such a difficult task. It's the dream. The dream looks easy, but the reality is really huge. And so I think that what stood out um, in your case study is that you've really embraced that relationship. You're more than just a technical technical farmer. Um, but that you have these abilities as a business owner and a kind of a business manager as well. And that makes you really unusual. Uh, which part of it is the most difficult for you, do you believe? Anything, Elmery, that you'd like to, to add to, to any further questions you'd like to place? Lassi, um, jou story is net so inspirational, ek is so jammer, jy kom, jy weet, ons het nie baie tyd nie, maar, maar van alles wat jy geleer het, wat was vir jou die, die grootste les, en wat sal jy sê vir ander klein bezighede, wat ook, jy weet, hulle eie bezigheid wil begin, ander mense daar buiten? Om uh, met put te wees in jou bezigheid, hard te werk, en dan elke dag net iets niets te leer. Yeah, lastly, I think, you know, the, the, the ability to want to learn, continue to learn, I think that is the biggest, uh, you know, the biggest learning and, and the biggest lesson. Thank you. Thank you, Lassie. Excellent. Thank you so much for that presentation. I mean, I think, so I'd like to open up to the room for questions. Um, but I, as, a, as an entrepreneur myself for many, many, many years and working with many hundreds of entrepreneurs around the country, it's very clear to me that the driving factor of success is the leader, the jockey. If you have the right person in charge with the right attitude, um, anything's possible. And I think that Lassie certainly epitomizes exactly that, that if you have the willingness to learn and you're willing to, to just go out there and, and uh, do the hard stuff, uh, success will come your way. So I think it's a beautiful um, opportunity, beautiful illustration there. I think from Distel's point of view and Stella Agri, um, yeah, it's again, it's this taking a risk uh, seeing an opportunity, really being passionate about solving a key challenge, a key problem in the industry, this thing of our transformation. How do you create, how do you create uh, black owned businesses? How do you foster transformation? And I think it, uh, I think it takes courage to, to start from within um, and, uh, and well done for the success that you've created. Uh, but maybe I'd like to pose a question to to Christian. So Christian, is there anything about this uh, about this case study that particularly stood out for you um, that you'd like to uh, comment on? Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, Christian from the IDC. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You actually uh, cut me off quite uh, ahead because I was just about to ask a question. I guess my fingers were a bit slow. So well, I think the main thing that um, um, uh, caught my attention was Basically, uh, the the timelines, if I may say, and that that was kind of my question uh, to to both uh, uh, El Marie uh, and uh, sorry about this. So my question was really, what do you think was uh, the the time when you could feel that uh, they were ready to take that next step, uh, especially from moving from the labor environment to more of the management and the training path that they took. Mm -hmm. The reason why I want to, 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 to emphasize, and if you can come uh, think about it in your answer, is the... the, the, the... All right, thanks, Christian. Fantastic question. I'm going to ask Charles to answer that. Um, Charles, from your, uh, from your ESD experience of, of helping many small suppliers to grow. Thanks, Catherine. I think I just put up my hand in, in, in an attempt to answer that question, because in the case of Stella Agri, it certainly was a case of learning by doing. When you and, and Catherine was absolutely correct when she commented on the fact that um, when you produce for a company like Woolworths, quality is of absolute um, essence and it is fundamental to everything they do. So the first crop that was produced, the bulk of the crop was rejected 
um, because it didn't meet all the standards that Woolworths had. And um, fortunately, then all the food was all the, 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 the vegetables were given to the community of Ebenezer, not because it was bad, but it just wasn't that superb quality. And this is the one message that we find is try to go for it, but then try to work with your buyer. So this was part of the beauty that that Lucas had or Lassie had working with the Woolworths guys is that they were on farm working on site, working with him um, and the um, other advisors on site to make sure that the next run was absolutely perfect that things were planned fully in advance so that at the end of the day, the crop would meet the necessary requirements. And this message, um, there was sort of no uh, wavering of that requirement by anybody. And um, there was quite a loss that was run, but between us and um, uh, Stella Winery, we absorbed the costs there. Um, and it was then into the next run that uh, we could then get the right kind of crop coming out of the right quality. Thanks, thanks, Charles. I mean, I think people that don't know agriculture uh, often uh, don't understand how long it takes, how difficult it is to grow good crops um, and how long the production cycle is, um, you know. And so I think it is a particularly, uh, it's particularly, it's lots of opportunities in agriculture, but also some of these really key challenges. I want to maybe ask um, Michal, uh, Michal Pile um, if she has anything that she particularly wanted to maybe uh, ask, um, ask Lassie, just thinking about the challenges, um, you know, of, of growing from being some one of the many to kind of being the leader. I don't know if you have any questions that you wanted to ask, Michal. Thanks, Catherine. And yes, the story is quite inspiring. And one of the things that I'm passionate about is obviously uh, collaboration, which results in market access. And and yes, we have, we have uh, uh, just tell supporting them, but I'd like to know what opportunities has arisen through collaboration and networking that has resulted in further um, market access opportunities. Because like we said, we want to develop these suppliers, but more importantly, we want to grow sustainable suppliers mm -hmm. who grow at, at speed. Um, and has that, has that have you seen that yet? And what are the plans for the future in terms of market access for that? If I may, um, Catherine, um, Michal, it's one of the most fundamental things to any small business is getting access to the right kind of market. And of course, if you can have the right kind of strategic partner, particularly a large corporate to help make it happen, it is immensely advantageous. So what's been happening is we've been chatting to Rhodes Food um, to create another avenue for uh, products uh, for crops from the farm. Um, and then Stella Winery, through their wine farming operations, have managed to secure a fantastic um, market for them uh, with uh, Tesco's in the UK, where butternut and pumpkin seeds are now begin, uh, being exported into the European Union. So it's really about saying, OK, these guys have the right technical competence and experience, and then to use the um, right kind of uh, support to open up further markets. And that's really what um, we've been trying to do. And Stella, in support of Stella Agri, has been also phenomenal at doing that. Yeah, thanks, Charles. I mean, I think it is a huge success that's in the making. Then over to you, Charles, just for a wrap up comment. Thanks, Catherine. And I'll be quick this time around. And it's just to say, I mean, he's being incredibly modest um, with his responses because he's rather shy. He's very much the production kind of guy that gets out there and gets just going with things and then works beautifully with his key partners, instilling confidence in them. And that's what he did with us and with Willem uh, of, of Stella Winery. He, and, and certainly it's been the case with Woolies and now with Rhodes as well, that you've got a sense of confidence that when the commitment is made, it can be delivered on. Because our role would be just exactly as Mary has just said now, that um, we want to see, we would like to see Stella Agri starting to play a much stronger role in the wine sector, because that's even least transformed, even less transformed than the agricultural sector in general. So um, our vision is to say, let's continue to support, to help grow and to improve the, the, the impact 
and so that they can really become a beacon, uh, you know, out there for other farmers as well. Love, lovely. Thank you so much, uh, Charles Wyeth uh, and Lucas Tennyson. Uh, that, as you can see, um, worthy winners of the uh, small um, small supplier award from the ABSA Business Day Supplier Development Awards. And thank you so much for that. And I, I really, um, uh, as Mary said. We, we gain a lot of uh, inspiration from this uh, from this case study of growth. Thank you so much. I'd now like to move on to something very different. Um, this is a different. This is a very different type of a case study. Um, oh, I did say it's in a fairly tricky sector. It's also a sector of lots of opportunity and currently lots of growth in the mining sector. And so I'm going to move over now um, to uh, the case study from Exaro and their small supplier, not so small any longer, MB Resources. Um, what, what really excites me about this is this is a case study of catalyzing rapid growth, not only rapid growth of a new uh, small supplier in, in a really major industry, but a woman owned business at the same time. And so what's exciting here is that they, they won, um, uh, MB Resources won uh, I think it was called the Radical Growth uh, um, SME Award. So not just being a good supplier, but actually being a supplier that has shown exceptional growth. And over the period of in question, uh, Lerato, um, uh, Lerato's uh, company, Lerato Lakata, um, her, her company grew by, by over, uh, over 300%. So this is really a, a, a very exciting case study, lots of different lessons to be learned. So I'd like to hand over to Lusapo Njenga, He's the manager of supplier development at Exaro, and he will dovetail with Lerato Lalaka, who's founder and CEO of MB Resources. Take it away for us, uh, Lisapo. Over to you. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks, Catherine, and good afternoon to everyone. I hope I'm audible. Perfect. Yeah, and I think, um, firstly, I think thanks for um, inviting us to reflect on the journey we've walked with MB Resources as Exaro, but I also think it's an opportunity for us to also learn and, and, and sort of sharpen the program that we do with the objective of creating impact in the areas that you operate on in and, and beyond. So what we'll be sharing with Lerato, who I'll be co-presenting with, um, is just basically, um, firstly, an, an, an overview of, of who Xaro is. I think a lot of people would, would, would know, some wouldn't know who Xaro is. So it's just taking you through what Xaro does, our rationale um, for ESD program, and just some of the learnings we've, we've made um, as a result of COVID, how we've intervened um, around COVID to ensure that the guys We've supported continue to survive and thrive. I will then hand over to Lerato, who's um, going to introduce um, her company, MB Resources. She's the CEO of MB Resources, just to take us through what the company is all about and some of the work, some of the pioneering work they've been doing at, at one of our latest mines. They were working at our flagship large mine, um, Potafelek in Lipala and Lipopo, but they were one of the, so we then recently opened a mine, I think, in 2018, 2019. And they were one of the first contractors to break ground at, at that mine. So one of the first guys to actually get, get caught out of the ground at, at that mine. And we've just really seen the company scale up in terms of um, in terms of growth in the last couple of years. It's a company that we're very proud of. We've profiled them a lot as much as we can. For example, one year we had Capital Markets Day where Exaro presents its strategy and plans um, to investors. The Roto was invited to share an, audi an, audi uh, an audience with, with investors where to get through the work that the company is, is doing for us. But also as part of our Supply Excellence Awards, there's been recognition in that area as well. So it's a company that we really acknowledge and are very proud of, of as Exaro. Then towards the end, we'll just also share on the current state of the partnership and, and, and where we see this relationship um, going going forward. Yeah, just to um, give you an overview of, of, of Exaro. So Exaro is a, is a publicly listed, similar to, um, to the Stealth Black Empowered uh, Mining Company. So our, our program is, is quite deliberate in that there is prioritization of, of suppliers from, from, from host communities so as much as possible. And we take our cue from, from our supply chain um, processes where there is a bias towards businesses from host communities, black owned, black youth owned, and black women owned business, which is aligned to the principles of the mining charter as well as the broad-based black economic empowerment. And so there's alignment to that and we really at a progressive um, level, trying to ensure that you're getting more and more um, supplies and contractors in these in this, um, demographics that are previously um, hard to get into our supply chain. But also more importantly, making sure that we get businesses that are involved in the, in the core mining activity. And MP Resources is an example of such a business that is involved in actual core, um, core business of, um, 
of um, of of mining. And then um, just looking at, um, at 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 what we are what we are trying to um, to solve as, as as the ESD program. So one thing we picked up is supply chain on their side. There's there's there's, there's, there's policies and there's and there's initiatives that really try to bring in um, con first time contractors in demographics like black owned, black women owned, and black youth owned businesses. I think everybody is aware that mining is a very capital intensive industry. You need assets to operate. If you're in logistics, you need trucks that cost millions, for example, whether it's moving um, over building or moving moving the coal, whatever it is, but you really need um, access to operate. So, And we, we saw um, good success. Companies were, were getting contracts, um, coming on board on the program, getting support in the form of grants or, or, or zero interest loans, and really being able to to survive and, and repay their own obligations, employ people from most communities, subcontract work to other businesses. So we really did see um, this paid forward principle then uh, that were on our program. I'll then head over to Larada who will um, introduce MP Resources, which is one of our premier contractors, and the work they were able to do and, and how the ESD program has, has enabled the business to grow um, to the level that it is at today. Thank you. Over to you, Larato. Thanks, Mustafa. Um, MB Resources, we've, we were born uh, 2013. You know, some of the delegates were not here, so I'm going to repeat what I said the other day because I'm very proud. We received the contract, the letter that we, we get, we got the contract um, in November, December, we go to the site, the so-called site. And uh, I've seen sites before. I've gone to sites, but when I got there, I found a bush, right? And uh, came with an, uh, um, an excavator to come and debush. I said, uh, basically, it is, it is such a moment, it's such a moment to be proud. It's such a moment to be an SMME. A SMME that says, you want to be an emerging, an emerging contract management, and you are there, and for the first time, right. So um, that was it. And um, two months after, after um, uh, getting the contract, we also received 25 million um, um, fund from ESD. I'll talk about it later. And then we bought. Um, Three, four ADTs, and uh, which we said we started and added to our fleet, and then we started employee. Currently, with we've, uh, we've got 400 local. Like he said, we've got the CEO Choice Award, and uh, if you look at our year timeline of our Belfast year, it's been great. It's been one achievement after the next, and really it proved that. If you want to see yourself emerging, you can actually do that. And really, we're happy with the first year uh, at Belfast. And we see the 25 million that we got uh, from ESD being one of those underpinning um, our success in that year. So well, 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 the case study focuses more on what we've enabled through financial support um, to MP resources. It's, it's basically one element of our perspective on, on ESD support where we try and be as holistic as possible. And what we've picked up over, over time is that non-financial support is as important as, as, as financial support. And to this extent, for example, around, <laughs> around the mining space is to engage the original equipment manufacturers and see how they can come to the party because it's in it's in it's in our shared interest to them to ensure that we develop successful and growing mining contractors because as a company like MP Resources grows, they will require more equipment, which basically means they go back to the same OEM to purchase equipment. So it's really this three-way relationship where the OEM is, is just as important in providing some of this, some of some of the support um, to, to some of the companies that that we that we are working with. So I'll hand over back to you again, again, Lerato, just to maybe give us um a view on some of the, like on the current state of, of, of where MB Resources currently is, and some of the some of the work you're doing to pay it forward, um, which is in line with Exaro's principles. 
of, of power and possibility. I just want to go back to uh, perspective on what you said on nine financial support, because uh, if you look at this contract, it's a huge overwhelming contract in uh, the size of a company of uh, MB resources. So uh, we went there, we get there, and uh, we had challenges with community. We had challenges with people that we were employing. We had uh, IR challenges. And when you talk about non uh, financial support, that's the kind of support we got when uh, uh, with Exaro. So I agree with you. It goes further than just giving us money. It is support that some of the things, you know, the risk management and risk mit mitigation that we thought we had, it was not enough. It was not enough and um, we needed support. And Exaro was able to hold us by hand. It, it just that encompassing. So it's not just the money, it's just holistic support. It's, it's August 2021. We found ourselves being the sole contract miner, contract mining company in Belfast. And um, our scope of works has doubled. Isn't it another achievement? Again, we keep going, we keep growing. And we still think, um, you know, the ESD support, the ESD soft lending, that helped us. I mean, we started there and then they got us four machines. And when you get that, um, uh, he said earlier, it's not easy getting funding from banks. Either you have a contract or you have um, uh, equipment. So uh, now we're bankable. Uh, even those banks that could not even look at us, now we looked good. We our production growth, if you look at it now, from 1.2 per month to uh, three whole uh, tons per month, that's another major contract, uh, sorry, um, uh, production uh, growth. And we make sure that we mine safely. We mine safely. We have not had fatalities. Obviously, that's not what anyone wants. But uh, we, we, don't, we haven't had any injuries in Belfast at all. But in the entire, the whole overall uh, MB resources, we have 3,647 days without. So we mine safe tons at all times. We have, again, we have the current status is that of the, the, three, um, the 3 million tons, 30% goes to our subcontractors. And then those subcontractors, um, two are women, and then they are all youth. Um, I think that's such a that's such a, a, a testimony uh, to the fact that you're really there um, to to share the benefit, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons that uh, you've been chosen by Exaro. Uh, uh, we've committed ourselves to Exaro that within the project or before the project uh, ends, we would have spent 135 million procuring from local um, uh, suppliers. So, which is a big one. Uh, we are uh, monitoring it every month. So that as well, it's, it's, it's one of those that we making sure that we are um, achieving or we are making towards our commitments. And now maybe not so much. I mean, there must be huge stress that's come along with this kind of growth. Do you want to just comment on that? Um, I think the first picture that you need to see is Belfast mine before and after the bush and now the mine that produces so many tons. But if you look at the picture that you have uh, there in this one, you will see um, the stress that has gone. But uh, you're right, it's, it's not an easy road. Um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's stressful. There are a lot of things that uh, happen that you haven't anticipated. So one won't lie that uh, you have not had a client that's not happy. Uh, you've had uh, weather that is more um, uh, rain that is uh, more un, um, anticipated or unanticipated than uh, many other years. So it's really, really, it can come that way. And like Lusapo said, we've had COVID and we've had to uh, request payment holidays, not just from Exaro, from other funders as well.
So um, it's it's not um, been easy sailing. Uh, I, I, I can I can absolutely believe that. And I think before I'm going to go through it, there's a question from Craig Vaughan I'm going to go to and then after that to uh, to Charles. Um, how long had you been in mining before you you uh, were selected for this growth path? Um, I said we started in 20, uh, 2013 and then uh, we were through um, Anglo incubation. So it was three years before we got a proper um, contract mining project that that was ours. So uh, basically it was three years. Um, yeah, with those Thanks, three years Thanks. we were uh, working with junior miners. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, that is definitely a rapid growth. Um, also from Craig, um, the question to you, Lusapo, uh, what made you select uh, Lerato? for this, uh, this support? What particularly stood out for you that made her a good opportunity to, for you to invest in? Okay, yeah, I think, I think everything starts off with the procurement process where we made a conscious decision that we're gonna be as transformative as possible at the Belfast mine and really involve black owned, black youth owned and black owned, um, black women owned businesses in the core mining activity. So through a competitive process, MP resources was selected to do some core mining work. For example, at the same mine, all of the core logistics is given to black women-owned businesses. That's a conscious decision we make. We make those decisions aware that these company, this companies might not have the required assets to, to successfully execute, but they really show potential in terms of executing these technical capabilities within the business. So it was for us to ensure that MP resources is set up to succeed as much as possible. And one of those ways was to provide them with the assets they need to operate the business as opposed to them working from a back foot where they don't have any assets, they have to lease assets from someone else at a high at a high leasing rate. So it was really to try and make life as easy as possible for them to, to succeed on the on the contract. But it's within a broader context of transformation, which is at the heart of what the company strives to do. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, uh, for that uh, for that feedback, um, Lesapo. Um, and before I go to Charles, I just also wanted to say that uh, XRO were winners of the Newcomers Award two years ago in the ABSA Business Day Supply Development Awards. And it was very clear, they were clear winners in that year. And the reason for that was because it's very, very determined, very well articulated intention to diversify, to diversify the income and to really make sure that they leave value behind in the host communities. And I think this is real evidence of a well thought out strategy uh, that's being implemented. As I just wanted to contextualize that. Um, Charles, go ahead with your question. Thanks, Catherine. Quick question for Lesapo. Lesapo, in your presentation, you made reference to the fact that you guys made a conscious decision to help the existing companies on your beneficiary list. Um, and that would be the focus area. Did you receive any resistance internally and externally when sort of that focus was there? Because it's always a difficult thing when you decide to focus on one pool of customers or p uh, clients relative to another, because I imagine you also get a lot of pressure from other companies wanting to come into your supply chain. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a, a tough sell chart. So I think everybody wanted to try and save the world when 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 COVID didn't what, what we took to the to the ESD committee was saying there's about um, 50 plus businesses we have, not because some of these guys have got loans, we want to secure loans, but you can you can have an approach of trying to assist a thousand people and maybe ten of those guys will make it through. Or you can just focus on these 50. And these are, and I mean, if you look at the employment, a company like MP Resources on its own is about 400 employees. So if you can secure a company like that, there's 400 families down the road that that you that that you that you securing. So once we presented the numbers and said these are the families' lives, livelihoods at stake if we don't really support and, and future proof these businesses and sort of and secure these businesses through that. So once we sold um, the secondary effect from an employment point of view. And what companies, what some, and also some of these companies had made commitments to support during COVID, providing masks to schools and and food parcels to families that are destitute. So we presented that whole picture, which also presented the guys are supporting as companies that want to to pay for it in terms of uh, in terms of COVID support. But we took a decision not to try and save the world, but to try and save these 50 plus guys because some of them are really doing important work for us as a business as well. And seeing them go under would have had an impact on the business. 
thanks, Usopo. That's a nice crystallized uh, view um, that you've shared there. Thank you so much. Uh, Michal, um, did you want to ask a question? I, I actually wanted to ask a question that Usopo just answered in terms of the, the employment uh, within the, the, the organization. And I think the comment I wanted to make, uh, if there are any corporates on the poll, I can't really see. Um, this is an absolute perfect picture of what supply development should look like. Um, from, from the commitment to the supplier through a supply contract, together with the funding, together with the non-financial uh, support, uh, together with the access to market, and then obviously the monitoring and evaluation which comes at the end. Uh, how have we impacted the community and what has this done? Um, so just uh, an encouragement to corporates that are keen to participate this year, firstly do, uh, and secondly, please show us all of these. Uh, this, is, this is how it's meant to be. So, so well done to you, Lerato, as well. For women in this sector, wow. Uh, congratulations, you've done well. Yeah, lovely, uh, lovely, Michal. Absolutely second that. And did you have uh, maybe some, some comments that, you, that particularly jumped out from this case? Um, Mikhail literally took the words out of my mouth. Um, I wanted to say that uh, congratulations to Xaro for a full-blown commitment to uh, developing a, a partner. But uh, these programs can be sometimes really uh, can depend on one, just one angle which doesn't work well. Uh, it could be material, it could be financial or non-financial. And uh, if enter uh, corporates are to commit, they need to commit to the full extent as 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 uh, as Exara has shown now. But that's all my comment. And uh, Lerato, don't worry, uh, the 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 stress didn't do you too bad. That can <laughs> tell you. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Christian. You get extra points for that, Christian. Um, perfect. I don't know. We have uh, Elmery. I don't know if you're able to, uh, you if you're still able to be with us. Yes. So she has a question from Elmery. Are there any plans from Xaro to support the development of Lorato suppliers? Now that's very interesting. Is there a downstream support plan, um, Lorato? Are you are, have you got a downstream support to help the suppliers uh, to you? Um. I don't know if Lusapo wants to take that one, but um, the 30% subcontractors I told you about, as it is now, um, they are applying for ESD for themselves now. And um, uh, uh, when I say as it is, we are helping them. We are just making sure that they also get uh, ESD. And then we are also, like I said, developing them to be contract miners. So that's how it goes downstream. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. There is a question uh, from the from the delegate panel. panel. Uh, Chai, you have a you have your hand up. Would you like to go ahead with a question? Uh, thank you, Catherine, um, and, and thank you to everybody um, on the call, um, your panelists as well. I made uh, uh, an opportunity to shout out to Elmarie earlier on. Um, my question is for both Lusapo and Lerato, Lerato in particular. Um, I'm also in the, the SME development space. So my question to her would be, uh, she has received financial and non-financial um, support, with, which is fantastic. What in her opinion is still missing and can, can go, um, can take her further? Thank you. Mm. Over to you, Lerato. I don't know. I don't think you can grow much faster than you're growing at the moment, but maybe you've got some plan in your mind. Eh? <laughs> yeah, no. Look, our funders, they still, they still um, have worries that we have one customer. So when you say go further, uh, it's perhaps looking, uh, looking for business or developing our business uh, elsewhere. It doesn't have to be just um, exaro because uh, risk is risk. So for us, it's just to mitigate. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the answer I can give you. Nice one, Lorato. And that's quite a big leap. Eh? It's always quite challenging when you have a massive contract. Um, you're so busy. Uh, you're so busy serving your one client. It does take a deliberate strategy to diversify. So I think yeah, you probably you probably uh, dropped the nail on the head there. Yeah, good luck with that. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to then close up uh, with some comments um, about what I see about these two these two case studies. 
And I think it's important that I see that there are two very clear common denominators between these two winners, these two pairs of winners. And, and that would be the, 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 the following. One, that we're really seeing in front of us a selection of, of uh, good leaders, really the good entrepreneurial leaders, um, entrepreneurs that are resilient, um, they're, 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 they're willing to take risk, they're committed to growth, and they're really always looking for opportunities to improve themselves. And that's the kind of thing that's so important. As I said earlier, you, if without selecting the right leader, you don't have a possibility of success. I think the second component is on both sides. Their assets have been provided or facilities have been provided in order to, for these uh, entrepreneurs to succeed. It's not easy to access land. We're talking in Lassie's case, up to 150 uh, hectares under production. That's a huge, uh, that's a huge asset there. And in, um, in Lerato um, Lelaka's case, it's obviously access to those four um, articulated dump trucks. Those, that provision of access, uh, assets is key to these businesses being able to, um, to get ahead. The third component, is, as, as both case studies uh, articulated, is access to support. And I think particularly in both cases, under stress, under the environment of growing a business, being able to access support, both mental support, but also skills development support is really key to being able to grow a successful business. But the last thing that really comes out for me is about partnership. And in both cases, Distel and Exaro have expressed and displayed a long-term commitment to the growth and the success of their businesses. And it's that long-term commitment that really creates this super success. And so I'd really like to uh, end off by saying congratulations to both of these um, pairs of organizations. And I really wish that you have this, uh, continue with this incredible success. And thank you so much for sharing your story. So I'd like to just then close off to say, to remind you again, just to thank every, everybody, delegates, presenters, and all of the tech team at the back. And to remind you that you will be able to find a recording of this and the other workshops on the ABSA Business Day Supply Development Awards website. A reminder also the 2022 awards are open. So those of you that in the room that want to be part of this and want to play the game, want to be part of changing the future of South Africa, learning from each other, sharing your stories and really building best practice, please do go ahead and apply um, on the, on the uh, SD Awards uh, uh, website. And then, of course, we invite all of you to become part of this insider's track. It's not available to everybody. It is available in application. And this is really where these really important nuggets of conversation um, take place. And lastly, I'd like to thank again our sponsor, ABSA. Um, I think I put here, helping make the country grow and making things happen. ABSA, you're amazing. All of you are incredible. Thank you so much for your participation and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now. <laughs>